Welcome to Cut to the Chase with Rob Chase. Brought to you by the InlandNorthwestReport.com. Alternative news and opinion for the Inland Northwest. And now, here's your host, Rob Chase. About the American Policy Center and what it uh, does. Well, we now focus almost exclusively on uh, trying to protect private property rights. I travel the nation talking to uh, uh, activists, uh, people who are uh, concerned about a lot of things that are happening to their property uh, by government overreach, and we're trying to teach them. We're creating uh, more and more tools on how to uh, fight back and, and protect uh, private property rights, and uh, that's that's what we do. Well, yeah. oh, private property rights are pretty important, aren't they? Private, private property rights, I think, are the most important right we have. Because if you don't have your own property to stand on, it's hard to declare your independence. It's hard to make a whole lot of other decisions. Other somebody else is going to control you know, the land you're standing on, and and uh, of course, obviously that's the problem. It's coming right. up. Well, I think the founders didn't they was the mission statement life liberty. But there's an argument of whether it's going to be property or, um, yeah. of course, the slavery thing came up. But then they changed the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Well, they they viewed pro uh, owning property as pursuit of happiness, and. Uh, so it's, it's it, 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 all the interpretations I've read, it means the same thing. That that's well, things have changed a lot in our lifetime, Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, especially the 60s. Uh, you know, I grew up in Seattle, but it wasn't the same town in 1970 that was in 1960. Mm -hmm. And uh, But there's a lot of almost like prophetic statements that came out. Um, uh, a report from Iron Mountain talked about a lot of the things going on today, the elimination of prop property rights and... Um, also, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, Brave New World, 1984. And um, so it's kind of like we're headed towards a dystopian society, uh, like Logan's Run, for instance, or um, Rollerball, or more recently, Hunger Games. And um, those don't look like the best societies. I was reading a, a book by H.G. Wells, he wrote in 1901, talked about what the new century is going to bring. And actually, that was very prophetic. It talked about um, the 1%, uh, you know, mm -hmm. They're becoming less and less, but owning more and more of the wealth of the, the world. And then the larger um, uh, the proletariat, you know, becoming larger and larger and having less and less. So uh, are we headed for that? Is there any way of stopping it? You know, every single one of those examples you just gave, uh, uh, those different uh, stories, had exactly the same theme. There was a totalitarian power at the top dictating everything you think, do, and say. Everything in your life. It's always been a mystery to me how Hollywood, for example, can make these movies very well telling these stories, but yet the very people making this, those movies don't get the message that they're putting in Well, there's movies. one like it called <laughs> Eyes Wide Shut. I think it was Stanley Kubrick, and mm -hmm. he yeah, died that. shortly after uh, mysteriously uh, <laughs> putting that out. But it was yeah. what, what we would call the totalitarian society. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're kind of finding out? Is the deep state? Absolutely, absolutely. There is very much a plan, uh, these people, to uh, an agenda to uh, control uh, our every aspect of our lives. And uh, we are seeing, as you said, you know, the, the communities aren't the same as they used to be. And you can watch, you can, you can do your research and figure and watch how new rules and regulations began to grow. The 60s, the 70s, and so forth, these, these things really did begin to grow then. And we're seeing uh, the culmination of it today. And uh, there's in every single city in this country. And we're, we're seeing the value of the country is, is going down as private property rights are being diminished. We're seeing the quality of life go down. We're seeing more and more. Uh, we have housing crises now. Now, why do we have a housing crisis? If you have a free market system that is uh, building you know, homes based on a market, people need it. How do we have a housing crisis? We have a housing crisis because we have government saying you can't do this. You have to do this and uh, making these rules and regulations. Well, a free market should always give you affordable housing. It may not be what sure. you want. It's enough to have a roof over your head. Well, sure. They're, they're going to create, if, if it's a, a you know, you, you can create, a, you know, mansions and you can create lower income or, or lower cost 
uh, of housing just based on you know various ideas there the you know, size of it and the materials and things like that and that's what a free market does and if there's a market for it then the free market's going to provide it that's what it does and it's all voluntary you can decide on your own if you're going to do this or do that but now what we have with rules and regulations that are, are uh, what we have now the use of eminent domain that is coming into cities. You've got people, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, planning groups, so forth, all sitting in the back scenes, uh, back rooms of, of government, and they're planning. They've got the maps out of the community, and they're making these plans, and they're saying, oh, this neighborhood, here's what we're going to do here. We have this grand new vision for what's going to happen. Well, that's a low-income neighborhood, but in that low-income neighborhood, there are people who own homes, there are people who have little businesses that they're thriving from there and, and, and living, and all of a sudden the bulldozers of eminent domain come in and take all that down, and what happens to those people? Now they build their grandiose new place, they can't afford to live there, and new businesses that are be the, the, the what were once were the local groceries or uh, you know little mom and pop shops, are now replaced by global corporations doing those things. Where do these people go? They are now forced onto welfare programs and public housing and their decisions of life, their chance to make a decision about their own life is gone because government bureaucrats are telling them how they're going to live. Well, when we were so, kids, and maybe this was your household too, uh, my mom didn't work, but there were six of us kids and um, <laughs> then if, you know, maybe about 20 years ago I realized, gee, my wife and I um, we have two kids, we both work, and we're paycheck to paycheck. And mm -hmm. what's different, I realize, is taxes and inflation. That led me to studying about the Federal Reserve. And when we have the manipulate us uh, through central planning, um, the money supply and interest rates and uh, the amount of money out there, it it's, um, causes a lot of booms and busts, you know. And each one we come off a little bit worse, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're headed towards that. But prophetically, uh, you're around the Washington, D.C. area, I think mm -hmm. is where you live. Okay, mm -hmm. where is a smoke-filled room, like the big smoke-filled mm -hmm. room, where this <laughs> takes place at? Then it's probably, instead of smoke, it's probably lattes or you know, something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would imagine that the main one is somewhere around the Capitol building <laughs> uh -huh. there, there. But uh, I'm talking about in the local communities, in your city hall. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you ever since the... Kilo decision in mm -hmm. 2006, the, the Supreme Court decision that shocked everyone because every word that had ever been said up till then about private property was the private property is sacred, that uh, you don't mess with that, that, that you know, the homeowners, you know, you, you own the property, you own the property. And uh, all of a sudden, the Kilo decision comes down where it says that if a community can better benefit by taking this piece of private property and transferring it over to this piece of private property, I mean private entities, private entities doing, not government, but private entities. Uh, uh, as, as Sandra Day O'Connor said, uh, the, the attitude here is if you have a Motel 6 and the community can make more money off of a Ritz-Carlton, too bad for the guy with the Motel 6. This is, this is the mm -hmm. good of the community. Once that decision was handed down, right immediately after that, there were over a thousand cases of eminent domain being used in communities across the country, and now it is just, you know, more and more and more. Well, they know happening. it's best for us. Yeah. Think, uh, that, and it, that's it, what happens. And the end justifies the means. Exactly. And, and what you see now is that private property is absolutely under siege. And uh, basically, the, the right you have to your property is to pay the mortgage and pay the taxes. Every other decision is made by these planners and these people behind the scenes saying, oh, we could do this with that community, with that neighborhood, we could do this with that neighborhood. And, uh, and, and you know, everything begins to look alike, everything is operating alike, and, uh, you know, there's the... There's totally well, control. you know, it seems like Hollywood, and I hear it's sort of like they have a sense of humor. They send this stuff out, like Hunger Games, and mm -hmm. um, that sounds like the Wildlands Project a little bit to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Georgia Guidestones, I mean, what is the purpose of that? Someone spent a lot of money to do this. Do you yeah, any... Very mysteriously, and uh -huh. nobody knows who did. I heard Ted Turner so, might have done uh, it. Well, you know, I've heard different things, yeah. but, but basically there's no record. Somebody just showed up one day in... Uh, I think it was in a, in a county building or something. They had this this uh, property, uh -huh. and they they and they they had these plans to put this together, and nobody knows 
really where and, that and came for from. And viewers, what do the Georgia Guidestones say? The, the Georgia Guidestones basically uh, talk about the, the absolute uh, emergency to lower the population. The population has to be lowered to save the earth, and it's got all different uh, ways that this needs to be done. And, uh, and it's, it's the goals of, of uh, uh, you know, what essentially are the goals of the radical environmental movement and the, uh, the movement of, of course, Agenda 21 really is the Georgia Guidestones in, on paper. And, uh, uh, you know, what, what they intend to do with us and how our society is going to be. And, uh, you know, it, it basically sends us back to caveman days. Well, it sounds so, like they're believers in Malthusian economics. Sure that there's a more and more people chasing fewer and fewer resources until mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. come to nothing and we mm -hmm. die, a, human race dies of death. So, um, uh, that's, I think, what would, how would you see it if you were, if um, uh, President Trump appointed Tom DeWeese you know, to be energy, or actually an environmental czar over the United States? How do you find mm -hmm. that right balance, you know? Mm -hmm. Well... <clears throat> What I've observed over all the years I've worked on these, these issues is that when government starts dictating how property is going to be used and taxing it and, and regulating it and so forth, that, uh, and, and government running things, that things start to go downhill, that quality is, goes downhill. Uh, gov when government's running it, you, you have a bureaucrat who has a need to have you sign off on this piece of paper. What hap he has no stake whatsoever in that property or, or the outcome to it, that it is property owners who own the land, who have a stake in it, have paid for it, have had their own goals for what to, you know, how to use it, and uh, the, you know if, if they let it go to seed, <laughs> for an expression, then they lose, and they have a stake in it. So the way to uh, have quality of, of the environment is to have it privately owned so that the people who own it are taking care of it. This has been proven time and again. This is the reason why the United States uh, exceeded ancient societies right off the bat because this was the only place in the world practically where people legally owned private property and it was theirs to use as they chose. And everywhere else your rights to all this stuff were decided by somebody else, kings, queens, whatever, you know, potentates. Yeah. And uh, they have no stake in it. And so they don't care what happens to it. I, I can give you examples all over the country <coughs> where the government has taken over things that used to be a private entity, and now it is, it is just a junk heap. Uh, one example is on the New River in West Virginia, a beautiful uh, place there, and the government suddenly decided they were going to make a scenic highway through this, and there were boat ramps and so forth, uh, 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 were places where people could rent boats and that sort of thing, docks and stuff, and the government, the, the, uh, the um, Park Service took over all of that, and all of a sudden it all went to seed. Yeah. People aren't using it anymore. And, uh, this is, you know, the, uh, I, I've had people tell me all over the country the Park Service is a terrible neighbor to have next to your private property. This is, this is just the what, what happens. It's natural with government. So we're talking about um, uh, public restrooms. Uh, now, if you're mm -hmm. driving, say, from Seattle to Spokane, mm -hmm. do you want to stop at McDonald's to use a restroom, or do you want to stop at, like, the public restrooms? I would rather, much rather prefer a Starbucks or a McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess if, if I were going to say, you know, legitimate... Uh, uh, purpose of governments to to provide such things, you know, as you're traveling down the highway, is, is, is I'm not opposed to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's okay. I stop at the rest stops and so forth. Yeah. Uh, I, I I tend not to stop at the, uh, you know, as you mentioned, in McDonald's or something like that, unless I'm going to stop there and buy something. Mm -hmm. you know, so, well, getting uh, back, to, I have a friend who's um, very libertarian. He says uh, there's a there's a private solution to everything, free market. Sure. But he says the oceans and the atmosphere are tricky. I mm -hmm. mean, how do you do it when you got other countries involved? Yeah. It, uh, <coughs> it is very tricky. I, uh, you know, in my, my younger days, uh, working in, in such issues, we were, we were advocating private ownership of rivers. One of the things that you, uh, you know, we have a problem with is the, uh, you know, you have the rivers are publicly owned, the government, and so we have this problem with pollution. You have the, the you know factories and so forth polluting the rivers, and that run dra drains down and it goes downstream. 
if they were privately owned, then the next guy downstream who is the, the first one subjected to the pollution that you put in there, he can sue you mm -hmm. because you've now damaged his private property, his, his, uh, his, his part of the river, and you would, it would be much cleaner that way. This is some of the things we talked about uh, in, in, in uh, other times. So, you know, there are uh, arguments for, for that sort of thing. And um, the, uh, the oceans... I, well, for instance, CO2, that, for some reason that's a, uh, a big rallying point, I think, for people who want to decide how we live. But uh, in the John Birch magazine, I read letters to the editor, a guy had written, you know, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is 0.04%. And of that, 3% is man-made. And I checked on Wikipedia, and he's right. And he said, it's really, uh, if, the, if the atmosphere is 100 miles thick, it's only the last 68 feet that is man-made CO2. And we need CO2. I mean, is man-made CO2 any different than uh, um, cow flatulence, you know, or any other kind of CO2 that happens to rise to the heavens? Yeah. So this this is the bogus argument, and mm -hmm. and uh, they've, it's it's literally a made-up argument. They, I I've seen some scientists now saying that they have a uh, a shortage of CO2, mm -hmm. and so you know it's a natural thing. The plants need it. The plants thrive from it. And, uh, you know, all these, uh, really, if you go into almost every single environmental position and what they say is the answer to making the environment better and so forth, you will find that it's the exact opposite. Most of the programs they're putting in place to protect the environment actually hurt it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, for example, the wind turbines. Yeah. The, um, in, in the early days when I started talking about this, these issues, I'd go on radio interviews and an environmentalist would always call in. And I don't think he was stalking me. I don't know what. <laughs> it was the same guy or whatever. But uh, they always had the same thing. They, they called me part of the AstroTurf crowd that I wanted to pave the earth. Well, nothing is, you know, even close to that. Yeah. The, uh, I was told by uh, an uh, energy expert, this was back about 20 years ago, at that time, if they wanted to use uh, uh, wind turbines wind energy to just t uh, close up the energy gap in the state of California. Just that. Mm -hmm. you would, Using wind turbines, you would need an area the size of Connecticut to have all wind turbines paved over completely. Who wants to pave the earth? I want us to have a power plant that takes up about three acres of land. They want to take up the size of Connecticut just to make up a shortage in California. What happens when the entire nation is converted to this? You will have this forest of wind turbines and, of course, the, the solar panels as well, going miles yeah. and miles. And you, the first thing you will notice is nothing is flying in the air. You know, the, the Audubon Society calls right. the wind turbines Cuisinarts in the air. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the, talk about destroying the environment. Yeah. This is what will do it. <laughs> but you, you mentioned a three-acre power plant. What kind of power yeah. would that run on then? Well, I'm not opposed to coal energy and uh -huh. uh, gas and so forth. Uh, it, it, they do not damage the environment. They are not polluting the air. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they are providing energy in just that, that short area for millions and millions of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, wind energy has never worked. And, uh, and for, the, for the most part, neither has solar. So we get like 3 to 4% of our energy from them. Uh, foreign countries are now beginning to disband, to, to, to toss out uh, all this. They bought into all of it. Mm -hmm. and, and try to follow it, and they're going bankrupt, and they have huge energy shortages. What we will have if we have to use this kind of energy, we will have, for, uh, what's incredible is one of the things they're doing is building all these high-rise, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. condos and so forth. Well, you need elevators to get up there. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to start to see uh, energy conservation at where at night a curfew is imposed, where all the energy is shut off. That'll shut off uh, third uh, shifts on factories. That'll have all kinds of uh, stores and stuff having to close at night, no lights at night. And how are you getting off the top floor of these things? <laughs> you know, maybe a great big fireman's pole or something. I don't know. Yeah. But this is, this is what it will result in. And, uh, you know, talk about changing our... our uh, our society, this is it. Well, that would put an end to um, the pack and stack vertical growth of cities. And if you've got to walk 
uh, 30 floors up to your apartment, you know, if the elevator's down. Absolutely. You do a brownout. <laughs> um, uh, now, there's a thing called, uh, there's a guy who's running for a mayor of Spokane called um, Highest and Best Use, and he's all for limiting the urban growth boundary, I guess, so the deer and the antelope can play, you know, out in, out in the fields and not have human beings around. Um, <clears throat> Is that a, uh, a viable situ- solution then? This is because this they is, want to keep people and I guess conserve energy maybe as part yeah. of it. It's double speak. Yeah. It, it's it, it. What he's saying is, we, a small few leading everything, know better how to use that property than the property owner does, mm-hmm. and it, it all leads to the same thing: shortages, higher taxes, more regulations, because we know best how to do this. Yeah. Well, getting yeah. back to energy. How come France seems to have a successful nuclear program, but we can't? Because we keep banning it. Okay. <laughs> we know, more, you know the old joke? More mm-hmm. people died in the backseat of Ted Kennedy's car than died at Three oh. Mile Island. <laughs> right. I know that's politically incorrect, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the truth. That's a good one, though. And, you know, nobody died at Three Mile Island. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we haven't had some massive nuclear disaster. They have created this huge scare tactic of nuclear, nuclear, oh my goodness, because we also make bombs out of nuclear you know, yeah. thing. and uh, so they've it's been helpful. They can show these bombs exploding. What will happen if the power plant? The Three Mile Island was a success story. It had a problem, and every single security thing they put in place worked. Mm-hmm. It didn't blow. Well, coincidentally, <laughs> I think the, the movie um, with uh, uh, Jane Fonda, out, Jane <laughs> Fonda came out almost exactly the same time. Yeah, sure. Uh, Just keep the hysteria going, right, right. but there's no truth to it, uh-huh. and so uh, you know there are all kinds of uh, uh, real energy alternatives. But is is there a in, difference? I've heard there's fusion and fission, and I can never keep them. One is yeah. safe and one isn't. So yeah. why don't we go to the safe one? Well, they do because yeah. yeah, that's why we haven't had a problem. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, I guess we've gotten by without Chernobyl yeah. or anything happening yeah. in well, this country too. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. And, and there again, perfect example of a totalitarian state where just bureaucrats rule everything, nobody has a stake in anything, and who had the power problem with the nuclear power? They did. Yeah. Not a free society, not where people are competing on a free market, not where people are uh, have a stake in things where they've got to make it work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, government control. We've had growth management here, uh, yeah. comprehensive plans so long, I forgot, what was it like before that? It seemed mm-hmm. to work, didn't it? Zoning, I guess? We had uh, communities that uh, that grew and people lived in them and they did their business and uh, people lived in their homes and built them as they wanted them to build and they didn't have a whole lot of problems. One of the things, it's, it's, it's interesting because if, if you want to make uh, one of these uh, sustainableist heads you know, just blow, is use the word unrestricted right of use. You know, oh my goodness, you know, and, 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 and we've, we, we've been joking with this because, you know, we're talking about unrestricted right of use, yeah. and they will always use exactly the same excuse mm-hmm. in here, the, 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 the horror story. If yeah. you have unrestricted right of use, somebody's going to build a dirty old pig farm next door to you. This is a scare tactic that they yeah. use. Uh-huh. But since the beginning of human society, we have had nuisance laws. And so if your neighbor is doing something that's affecting your property, mm-hmm. first of all, as a neighbor, mm-hmm. you can go over and say, Charlie, you got this noise at night. You've got this light shining in my bedroom window, whatever the case may be. Can you, can you, do, you know, do something about that? Yeah. Charlie's a good guy. He says, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And he takes care of it. Neighbor to neighbor, people living together. If Charlie's a jerk, you can take him to court on a nuisance law. Mm-hmm. But... Global uh, uh, sustainable development, smart growth programs that are taking over every community are all one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And in that one size fits all, there is no private property, there is no personal decision, there is no uh, ability for you to live your life as you choose. It's all a one size fits all straitjacket that somebody else is making. No, it seems like it it depends on density. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you live close to each other, then maybe you need more laws. If you have 40 acres, you know, you, you can pretty much do what you want. Um, if you build a sawmill on your property, well, then that's 
the noise travels, that's an act of aggression. Or if you have a pig farm, you know, the, <laughs> the smell wafts over and you can't yeah. sleep at night, well, that's yeah. an act of aggression. So you do sure. have, um, you know, legal remedies in that case. But yeah. uh, maybe when people live so close together, because it's definitely, you know, the yeah. urban areas are blue mm -hmm. in their voting and the red areas are rural in their voting too. So it's almost like having red eyes, or I mean, not red eyes, blue eyes or uh, <laughs> brown eyes, you yeah. know, the point of view you see things from. Yeah. Well, obviously, the more people you got together, the more potential you have for problems. Mm -hmm. But again, the property owner has lost his ability to defend his property. It is all decided by government. Oh, we got a rule of regulation for that. And, uh, you know, it, it, what we have now, for example, this, this new movement that is taking place to end uh, zoning protections for single-family homes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the answer here for them is to bring uh, apartment buildings and so forth in there, lower income uh, things. And so, forth. and so now you're bringing people into that neighborhood that uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, I, I, again, politically incorrect about it, but uh, you're, you know, what do you have in, in a lot of the lower income areas? You have these MS-13 gangs. You mm -hmm. have uh, all kinds of uh, illegal activities and so forth, drug dealers and all that, moving into your neighborhood. Now you've got more crime. You've got more uh, things that you, know, that you have to deal with. And again, the government is pushing that in there, and your ability as a property owner to defend your property against that is eliminated. Mm -hmm. So now you have to live in it. And I, I mean, I really feel for the folks who are living in, in some of these low-income neighborhoods where all of this is their life and they're afraid to walk outside. They have no right to defend their property because it's government housing. Mm -hmm. And here's what's going to happen here with this. The, uh, the attack on private property, the, um, uh, first of all, building all these high-rises and so forth into the city, and now, uh, you know, a lot of those are rental properties, and you have private landlords who are, you know, build the properties and, and, and uh, run them. Well, now they've put all kinds of rules and regulations on, uh, on the building codes, the materials they can use. They've raised taxes. You know, can't put parking lots in there. You know, things like this, and it's becoming more expensive for the landlord to operate. So, what's his natural reaction? Mm -hmm. He raises the rents to pay for it. He's got to do that yeah. because he doesn't have an unlimited source of money. Well, like it's, it's just all passed down to the consumer. Yeah. Then. Sure. You know, he just, but, yeah. but. What's happening is they are now saying, well, that's not fair to raise the rates of people on like that. We're going to put rent controls on you. And now they, and, and in, in, in Baltimore, the NAACP filed a lawsuit uh, against single family homes and so forth, bringing things in. And one of the things they said was, uh, and part of the, of the, of the uh, settlement on it was, landlords were no longer allowed to ask a potential renter if they could afford the rent. That's racist. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what's going to happen where all this comes together? Mm -hmm. The bottom line is all housing is going to become government housing. There will be no private property mm -hmm. in this country, and that's what you're seeing happen in city after city as time you goes made by. an interesting observation. I think it was last night that um, these people love diversity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love, uh, say, the charms of Sweden, or, or the city of Paris versus the city of London or Edinburgh. Sure. But they're all, they're for that, but yet they want everything to become one uniform thing, which is... Because the bottom line here is control. Yeah. And having everything uniform is control. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have somebody uh, breaking off from that, they're messing up their well-ordered society. I'll give you an example. You know, Alexander the Great and Thomas Jefferson lived in the same world. Mm -hmm. Their travel was horse travel. They lit their homes with candles. Yeah. A few years after that, along came Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, the yeah. Wright brothers, and they completely transformed our society. Mm -hmm. the, the sustainablists are determined to never again allow a Henry Ford, a Thomas Edison, and the Wright brothers to exist. Or an because, enlightenment. Exactly, because that destroys their, their well ordered that society. gets right back to education. Mm -hmm. Your problems with education, where it's like exactly. factory produced uh, mm -hmm. people that are, uh, like George Carlin said, you know, I'm not exposed to critical thinking, just mm -hmm. smart enough to 
keep the machinery operating. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you're just a drone in it. Mm -hmm. You are an asset. This is to go back to the kilo decision. They, uh, these kind of things. They're, you are just becoming a human asset, and 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 take a look at Obamacare, for example. Mm -hmm. The uh, and we talk about the um, uh, not giving care to uh, people who are elderly or uh, you know can't recover from what they have. Mm -hmm. They're a drain on society. That means you're a drone. You are not a free person making decisions in your life to live your life with your, you know, as you want, with your goals, what you want to do with your life. They have decided, this is where we need you, and well, we don't need you. We're going to put you over here. Yeah. Until we say we love Big Brother, you know, yeah. uh, like Winston Smith. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, American Policy um, uh, Institute, um, Associate, no, Center. Center, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do people get exposed? You've written several books too, haven't you? I have, yeah. Okay, and those are now you can get them there or on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Tell the viewers a little bit about where sure. to find you, then, Tom. Uh, our website is AmericanPolicy.org, mm -hmm. and on there you'll find a large archive of articles that we've written on a huge amount of subjects, including education and personal privacy and things like mm -hmm. that, along with property rights issues. Yeah. And uh, we've worked very hard to create tools to help local activists uh, stand up and learn how to fight some of these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a, a, a couple books. Uh, my, my book, my latest one, is called Sustainable, The War on Free Enterprise, Private Property and Individuals. I wrote it as a handbook for uh, the uh, uh, you know an activist to be able to use it. It's got the background, a lot of things we've talked about, and it's got some suggestions on what to do, how to how to stand up, and fight back, and uh, so that's available there. It's also available on Amazon, and um, my other the book before that uh, is called Erase. And I never wrote fiction before in my life, oh, yeah, okay. but this is a, uh, a murder mystery political thriller based on the very subject we're talking about mm -hmm. with, you know, these, these uh, we're talking about the deep state and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting because I wrote this before Donald Trump mm -hmm. and all the attacks on him and so forth, and I just reread it uh, uh -huh. the other day, uh -huh. and I was astounded by how That's much it contained, uh, the very prophetic uh -huh. in it. And uh, uh, I, I was shocked with the reviews that I got for it. Uh, 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 the first review I got was, Tom, I think this is the most important political novel since 1984, Atlas Shrugged, and Michael Crichton's State of Fear. Mm -hmm. I just fell on the floor when I read oh. that. No, of but, course, uh, I'm yeah. going to ask this for all my Bernie <laughs> friends. You must be funded by big oil, aren't you? <laughs> you know, I wrote an article entitled, Funded by Exxon? Nope, never got the check. <laughs> I, I actually uh, wrote a letter to the chairman of Exxon, and I said, you know, I'm taking all your heat. Where's my money? Uh -huh. The truth of the matter is Exxon gives no money to people like me. They are giving it to the Sierra Club and the exactly. Nature Conservancy. That's, that's and I keep wondering, well, are they now lackeys of big oil? Mm -hmm. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they all work together in the great big Hegelian dialect. Exactly. Great. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's been a pleasure. We just barely scratched the surface, but... Go to uh, Tom's website and find out more. And this has been Cut to the Chase, and let's not forget to pray first. This has been Cut to the Chase with Rob Chase, where we cover anything under the sun that would be of interest to you, our viewers. Cut to the Chase has been brought to you by the InlandNorthwestReport.com, alternative news and opinion for the Inland Northwest. Don't forget to catch the Sunday edition of Cut to the Chase where Rob interviews local pastors on Christian perspectives.